Welcome to Broadway Drumming 101. My guest today has something in common with these people. Phil Collins, Karen Carpenter, Don Henley, Levon Helm, Sheila E., Roger Taylor, Ringo Starr, Peter Chris, and Dave Grohl. What is that that he has in common with all of them? He is a singing multi instrument I can't even say it. He's a singing multi-instrumentalist and all-around great drummer, great guy, Dennis Arcano. I should like include oh, the uh, like the hand claps like <laughs> I, my, damn, that was a great intro. I'll take it, man. Thank you. Good to be <laughs> and, here. And he's just as this, good. Uh... He's just as good as all these people I just rec- uh I I rattled off here. And you will hear about him in the same context as these people. Thank you for being a part of this show. And uh, I have many, many questions to ask. I love your setup there, man. It looks great. Thank you. My little home studio where I make the magic happen. Yes. See, it came know. in very handy during the pandemic, for sure. <laughs> uh-huh. You're doing a lot of music production? Yeah, did a lot of recording. A lot of, like, a lot of people were asking for, for drum tracks, for virtual things. Did a couple of... Uh, Broadway cares things did a uh, Jimmy awards uh, tracking here. Yeah. So it, it kept me, kept me working. No, we great. didn't have any live gigs. Now <laughs> I'm, I met you back in 2001, correct? Or was it before that? That's correct. Nope. 2001, 20 years ago, man. Now, and we look we... exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> I just have a little a fewer hair follicles in my head, but <laughs> <laughs> where, how did we actually meet? How, how did you connect with me or how did I connect with you? Let's see. I believe I read on Playbill.com that there was this musical Tick, Tick, Boom come into town. And I was a huge rent head already. And it just so happened that uh, Stephen Oremus was musical directing and Matt Beck was playing guitar on the show. So I hit both of them up and said, hey, let this Clayton guy know that you've got this drummer who would be great for subbing on his show because... I just want to get into that scene. And, and they both followed up with, which was cool. They both introduced me to you and uh, the rest is history. <laughs> How did you meet Steve and, uh, and Matt? I, I actually bet, met them both at the same place. I met them both at the Candlewood Playhouse in New Fairfield, Connecticut, back in the mid nineties. Uh, it was, that was sort of my first professional gig. Uh, I was in college. I was only 19 at the time. Uh, and I started playing for this equity theater up here in uh, New Fairfield, Connecticut. And Matt's mother, Dolores, was a French horn player, also was the contractor for the theater. Um, and she had hired me. Uh, it was like it was the summer between my freshman and sophomore year of college. My dad had found me this really great job uh, being a telemarketer answer or like phone, in, you know, it, doing this. It was horrible. And literally after the first day of this job, I come home to a phone call from, from Dolores Beck saying, we need a drummer for a production of Carousel at the Candlewood Playhouse in New Fairfield. And you were recommended by your college, you know, drum professor, David Smith at Westcon. Would you like to do it? And I was like, sure. And on that gig, Stephen Oremus was maybe, I guess he's probably five years older than me. So he's like, you know, early twenties, he was sitting back on, you know, key three, just playing simple string patches, you know? Uh, and then, I ended up playing four seasons at that sh- at that theater. The last four seasons before they closed, so we did we did four shows a summer, and then Dolores obviously hired her son to come in whenever that we needed a guitar player. So I did. Um, uh, what did I play with Matt? Matt played on Crazy for You, and I'm not remembering what other ones Matt did. But I also asked Matt to play on my senior recital when I uh, when I graduated from Westcon. So he came and he. I have a great YouTube video of that out there of Matt Beck and I back in the 1997. It's hilarious. Uh, but yeah, so I met both of them at that theater. I also met Simon Matthews, um, oh, yeah. sound designer. He was our sound engineer there, who I believe was your, uh, he was on Alter Boys, your sound designer for that. But he's also like one of the most working, workingest, uh, is that a word, workingest? <laughs> uh, <laughs> sound engineers in the city. And, and he also was, so those three guys, I always, I always credit Simon, Matt, and Stephen with my career, you know, my future career in theater from from those gigs we did together at the Candlewood Playhouse. Wow, where's where's yeah. Candlewood again? It's in the Greater Danbury area. So uh, the actual the, the town itself where the theater was was New Fairfield, Connecticut, which is about ten minutes outside of out of Danbury, 
right on the Camdenwood Lake up there. And it was a great, it was a great equity theater. I mean, a lot of, there's a lot of history there. A lot of like, you know, well-known actors and actresses performed roles there. Um, and it was great because for the act, they, they would house them on these like lake houses. So, you know, it was like a summer vacation and getting, you know, getting paid to, to do quality professional theater. Oh, you know who also worked there? Dave Clemens, who is now a big time Broadway casting director. He was the Che in our production of Evita that I played there when I was 20 years old. Um, yeah, a lot of, so a lot of like, you know, people who just went on to be the people who are in the Broadway scene now, you know, we all got to start somewhere. And it was just the fact that we are basically 90 minutes outside of the city doesn't hurt either you know so we, we can we have that close access back and forth so yeah well that's what all I, began for me man you and i have something else in common other than the fact that we worked with steven and matt and we're drummers and uh we are both from the state of connecticut that is true were you born and raised in born, connecticut yep born born in stanford connecticut because that's where my family was originally from mother and father both both from stanford uh, but was raised in Norwalk, Connecticut, and now living up here in the greater Danbury area of Connecticut. So I've been a Connecticut native my entire life. And, you know, <clears throat> I think that's another reason why it was uh, the Broadway thing was so attractive because it was always, you know, right there. You know, from Norwalk, it was a 45 minute train ride. Uh, from here, like I say, it's about a 90 minute, you know, drive into the city. And yeah, so being in Connecticut definitely made it easier to pursue that career right? you know listening to people like uh sean mcdaniel and talking about coming from you know texas and all these other states i'm like my god that must have been so you know or or what was it matt talking about coming out from california it's like i couldn't imagine like uprooting my whole life to come out and you know pursue this thing but being right here always being able to sleep in my own bed after a show has always been nice <laughs> did your parents bring you to a lot of shows when you were younger my so I don't come from a family of musicians like a lot of a lot of people have I have mentioned, but music was always a huge part of of my life. Um, my dad was a huge doo-wop fan. He would sing doo-wop throughout the house all the time. My mother loved all the R and B bands. As a matter of fact, I, I when she when she heard there was a musical about the Temptations, and she knows that I'm in this scene, she's like, "Do you know anybody on the Tempt on the Ain't Two Pound? I got to see that one." Like, I think I know the drummer on that one. But, so she was, she, she loved, that was like one of her favorite bands. So yeah, we always had music, but um, I don't, we never really went to Broadway shows per se, but we definitely went to concerts, performances. You know, there was this always music. My, my grandmother, um, my mother's mother, a huge opera fan. You know, when, when I got older, I would take her into the Met and see shows and, you know, she performances down there. So yeah, and I, we didn't go to too much, but there was always music in our lives in some way, shape or form, which is definitely why I think I, I pursued this career. So well, what got you into uh, playing drums? So I'm a sort of a late bloomer on, on the drums, drumming, uh, playing. I was in eighth grade. I had a friend who I had known since first grade who lived right around the corner from me, who had been taking drum lessons his whole life. And, you know, every once in a while we'd go down to his basement and he'd show me, you know, all right, do this with your right hand and do this with your left hand and try to do that. And I, I took to it kind of pretty quickly, which was, I was like, hmm, maybe this is something I have a talent for, you know, I have an ability to do. Um, so God bless my parents in the Christmas 1989, out of nowhere, I just said, I want a drum set for Christmas. And instead of going like the, let's get you a, a practice pad route or let's get you like, you know, a little toy drum set. For, they like, they, they, they went got you a double bass base. kit. <laughs> yeah. Right. They got me, actually, they got me this, this Pearl export drum set. That's right here behind me. The red the one drum set, oh. the red one, but it wasn't red when they bought it. It was the old school black wrapped with, you know, Chrome hardware. Yep. And a couple of years back, I was just like, you know what? I want a new, I just, I peeled the wrap. I hand painted them myself, got the power coating on the rims. And now it's like, I have a whole new drum set with, you know, 30 something years experiences with me. But um, yeah, they went like full out and bought me the drums and I'd sit there in the basement for hours, driving them nuts with, you know, Bon Jovi, Aerosmith, all the hard rock hair bands of the, the late eighties, just trying to figure out what they were doing. And that, that's sort of how I got into drumming, you know, just kind of by, by, and then, and so my friend, um, asked the band director at the, at the middle school at the time, you know, 
we don't, we only have one drummer, you know, himself playing in the jazz band. Like, could we have, you know, can we have Dennis like maybe join in? And the very last <clears throat> end of that eighth grade school year, I played on like the graduation concert. And this is an interesting fact. My principal at the time, his name was Leroy Vaughn. He was the father of Mo Vaughn, the Red Sox uh, first baseman, I think he was back. And he, he guest conducted the first song I ever played, which was uh, Stand By Me, my first live performance <laughs> conducted by Mo Vaughn's father, our principal. So yeah, yeah, that's how I, that's how I got started in it all. Did you see yourself becoming a big rock star or were you, did you say, you know what? When I get older, I want to play in musicals. At that time, like, you know, when I first started. Yeah. 1990. Uh, I, did you want to like, 19, you know. I didn't think that being, me personally, I didn't think that being a musician was a career. Like I, th I thought it was just something really fun that you do. You know, it didn't take me until when I got into high school and it's like, you know, we're starting to talk about, okay, what are people going to do for college? Where are we going? Where it was like, well. I've played in every musical group in the high school, you know, either as a drummer or sang in the choir or playing timpani in the orchestra. I mean, I, I had done everything where I said, let's, let's go that route. So I, I really had no idea that I'd be, you know, and knock on wood, it's been, you know, 25 years of being a professional musician. I've never had to do any other type of work in my life. Like I've, I've made a career for myself in one way, shape or form as either a musician, a music educator, you know, um, but yeah, no, I don't, once I started thinking about becoming a professional musician, it definitely was theater was what I wanted to do. Of course, everyone wants to be a rock star, but I, I, I'm one of those guys who was like, for some reason I'm drawn to this. I had experiences with it young, you know, in high school. I played in the shows in high school because, you know, friends of mine were in, in the cast and were like, hey, come play, you know, we did Into the Woods and we did Anything Goes in my, you know, junior and senior year. So yeah, I just started kind of, getting interested in doing the theater thing and it, and it just kind of snowballed from from high school into college into my into the time when we met which was about you know five years after I graduated college or yeah I graduated 98 so three three four years after graduating and then starting that starting that career it, yeah it's been great so you went to college it's a, you, it was a surprise <laughs> what did you where did you go to college and what did you study so I did my undergrad at Western Connecticut State University uh, in Danbury, Connecticut. I was a music education slash percussion major because at the time of this is I always love telling this story at the time of filling out my you know college applications at that time, it was very minimal. It was like music ed, music performance and always being the self, you know, uh, like self doubting person. <laughs> I'm like, well, I don't think I'll ever be good enough to be a performer. So I'll go for I'll go for music education. That 18 year old mentality would couldn't have been further from the truth. Because I'm also I've been a public school educator for for 24 years now. That's been way harder than having a performance <laughs> career. <laughs> so uh, but that I did I did major at, 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 in um, music education percussion at Western Connecticut State. And I studied with uh, Dave Smith, who was the principal percussionist for the New Haven Symphony for a very long time. He just retired about two or three years ago. Uh, he was a student of Fred Hinger. So he was the person that sort of took me from one, you know, just being a drummer to being a percussionist, a musician, and, and sort of seeing things outside of just behind the drums. You know, he was that kind of player where when I, I first saw him play marimba and I was like, dang, you know, he was just four mallets going, you know, I was like, and again, 18 year old mentality thinking, uh, he's good at, you know, he's good at mallets. He can't be good at, you know, timpani or drum set. And then I saw him play timpani and drum set and he killed that too. So I was like, okay, I, I have a lot to learn from this guy. So I owe, I owe a lot of my um, success as a, as a percussionist and, and musician to, to Dave Smith. So uh, yeah, so that's that was that was my major, and and then my master's uh, in uh, I went to SUNY Purchase about ten years later. I waited a while, ten years after uh, I started my my master's studies, and that I did in studio composition um, because in that ten year span, I, as you mentioned before, I started getting into being more of a multi instrumentalist, playing guitar, keys. I actually conducted a show that you played for me, Zombie Prom. I piano conducted a high school production that I got you to come up and play drums on, which was cool. So I, I went back and did a master's in um, in studio engineering and composition. And that's you know where I do a lot of this uh, work here in the home studio now. 
SUNY Purchase. Oh, sorry. SUNY Purchase. I have a yep. uh, friend's son who's going to SUNY Purchase now and studying drums there. Seems oh, like cool. a nice nice campus. I mean, the the master's um, program is on the same in the same location as the undergrad. Okay. Yep. Yep. Same. So, yeah. Same building. Same conservatory music. Same building. Yep. I often ask people that go to music school why they chose that particular school and not something else like North Texas State or Juilliard or Cleveland Conservatory. I don't even know what <laughs> what's out there other than you know the major names. Why uh, Western Connecticut? I know it's close. It's probably cheaper. yeah. I think uh, yeah. I I think for me it was the fact that again going back to Dave Smith, he was really good at at recruiting into his program, um, and he would he would appear at like the high school jazz band competitions or the jazz or you know like the high school marching band competitions. But that was a big part of my my high school career was was marching band like. I was all in on marching band. Like that was yes. my before theater. It was like, you know, but again, never thought there was a way to. So, um, but he, yeah, he would, he would kind of, kind of recruit. And so he came up to me a couple of times and invited me up to, to see things at Westcon. And so I had heard so much about, you know, the fact that it was a small school and you'd get attention paid to, you know, like I was one of 12 or eight or 12 percussion students at the time as opposed to one of, you know, a hundred. And so there was, I, I definitely always say, you know, to people, it, my opinion is it doesn't matter where you go. I mean, uh, sure it does. <laughs> there are definitely certain connections that can come for certain places, but it's what you're gonna put into it is what you're gonna get out to it. And I think I'm living proof because I've been able to have a, a pretty good career in performing, even though that wasn't my major, as I wasn't a performance major, Dave Smith was cool enough to let me do the, I, uh, even though I was taking education classes, he still gave me what per, uh, performance majors did as like a, a hourly study a week, you know, kind of the private lesson things. So I guess why I was feeling sort of a double major. But yeah, I mean, I guess Westcon was just like, it was close. It was, you know, from Norwalk to Danbury was about 40, 45 minute commute. Um, I did live on campus just to kind of get that experience. And I'm glad I did. That's where I met my wife. We met in my, our freshman year. Uh, of of college at West Con. she was a, a flute major there, um, but yeah, I, I I don't even to be honest with you, I can't even remember what other schools I, I don't I didn't apply to too many, because again back then I didn't really know, like what my you know where my career was going to go or what what I really wanted to. It's hard to know what you want to do when you're 18 years old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you graduated from undergrad and you decided to stay in the area. Did you ever think about moving to New York City? And, you know, I, I want to play in musicals. I want to just be around the city and the excitement and the cr the crime. And I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that, I'm not. I'm it wasn't not, that much I crime love... back then. That's true. That's true. <laughs> the, no, the city was always that nice place to visit thing for me. You know, I loved being, <laughs> I can remember even during college, all of us would jump on the train We'd go and see Les Mis, Miss Saigon, Phantom of the Opera, like every week. Back then when tickets cost like 50 bucks, mm. uh, you know, we would sometimes go a few times, you know, a month. And I loved it. I loved the lights. I loved the energy, even the smell. It was that, that city smell, you know, it was just, but when I, when I think about like, could I live here? Something about it just for me, just for me as a person, I just, I, I was always like, I like being out in the burbs having that little peace and quiet, getting away from all the action. You know, like it, it, when I retire someday, like I'm a, I'm a Sedona, Arizona person someday, like just off the grid, you know, beautiful, quiet. So yeah, it's, it's always been nice to have that close access, but to not have to, you know. And I think that's why I've probably, as far as the Broadway scene goes, I've been a sub, you know, I've subbed on several shows. It'd be very difficult also with my teaching career to ever get a, you know, a chair, but also, I, you know, I'm not going to be the guy that you're going to call at 730 when you're stuck on the train because it's going to take me 90 minutes to get there. So, you know, so th I, I, that's a trade off. You know, I, I had to trade that off. But yeah, I, I never really had a desire to get in and live in the, in the city. Well, I was speaking to uh, Jesse Ray Leach the other day. And for anyone listening don't let it be a, uh, something that will discourage you. Uh, you don't necessarily 
have to live in New York City in order to get a subbing job or even a Broadway chair? Because a lot of people that do have Broadway chairs do not live in New York City. They live in New Jersey or they live somewhere in Westchester or Rockland County or Connecticut, like the drummer for The Lion King. <laughs> he lives in Connecticut. Or and, the conductor for Jagged Little Pill lives in Connecticut, <laughs> right next door to me. He's yeah, a buddy so of mine. it's not something that you necessarily have to do anymore. Yes, you have to be in the scene and you have to you know, know people and they have to see your face. And being a sub on a show, you get to meet people and they get to know you and you get to uh, network that way. But if you're responsible and you get into the city and you can become a, a, a reliable sub, your name will get around and you'll get to do other things, which leads me to 2000, actually 2001. Yeah, because it was 2001. And uh, we connected. Now, was Tick Tick Boom your first show that you subbed on? No. In in May of 2001, just before I met you, I subbed my first Broadway show, which was the 2001 revival of Stephen Sondheim's Follies. There's been several revivals since then, but this was the 2001 revival starring uh, Treat Williams and Blythe Danner. Um, and that was Billy Miller's drum chair. And going back to my Candlewood days, Simon Matthews was the A1 audio engineer on that, that production and had given my name to Billy and God bless him. He was trying to get some, you know, fresh people who had never done anything like that before in. And just, I, I connected to this when I listened to, uh, to Bill Lanham. Well, Bill, I, well, I, I got to come back to Bill Lanham too at some point, but when I was listening to Bill's, Bill's podcast with you, I had the same experience where did all that work got in there, played my first, you know, sub, I subbed on Broadway for Billy Miller on Follies and three weeks later the show closed. Oh. So I, didn't, I only got in there one time. I used to joke with Billy that it's because of me that the show closed. See, they, once you had me, they were like, no, nope, we can't do this anymore. We got to close this show. But yeah, so I had that experience where, you know, back then I was 25 years old. I was just so excited that I, you know, finally got to do this thing that I had always wanted to do. But so, so you were my, you were my second show in the city that I had, that I had subbed on. Now right. I have a question for you though. Was, was Tick Tick Boom, I never, I never knew that. Was Tick Tick Boom your first, that was your first chair that you, that you had in the city, right? That's correct. Now had you had subbed any shows before then though? I had not. I was introduced to the whole Broadway scene through Matt Beck because we used to play in mm -hmm. club date bands together. And he's like, man, I got this. I just heard about this show going to Las Vegas for three months and it's probably going to go on a tour. Would you be interested? I'm like, sure. I was had nothing, you know, I just met this woman that would eventually be my wife and ex-wife. And, and, uh, I decided to go out to Las Vegas and I really liked getting a steady paycheck and playing the same show every night. And it was fun. I was like, wait a minute, this is kind of cool. Then I went on a tour of the show, I went around the United States and I saw just how beautiful this country really is. It's a beautiful country. It's different around different sections and people think that their world revolves around them and everything's like that. No, there's a whole world, uh, there's a whole different world out there. So I got to travel around the country, again, making steady money, playing drums for a living instead of, you know, I, my path was a little different. I had, I did, I chose to work day jobs and work in corporate America. And I was so glad to eventually get out of that world. But Matt said to me when I was on the tour, I said, would you be interested in coming back to New York to play this, this, this off Broadway show called Tick, Tick, Boom. I had had no idea about Broadway and what it was all about. I just knew I was making money as a musician, which I always wanted to do. I started growing out my hair and grew my dreadlocks long back then. But when I got back into New York, I remember when I was on the tour, I remember hearing some of the people that were really into Broadway talking about Jonathan Larson, Rent, and you, you don't know about Rent, you don't know, know about this show? I'm like, no, man, just where's the Parliament albums? Can, can we talk about <laughs> funk or rap or something cool? Like, no, just check this out. I'm like, oh, God, really? So in, in any <laughs> event, <laughs> I got back and I started rehearsing with Stephen Oremus, Conrad Adderley, and Matt Beck, 
and I, I might be wrong with this number, but I remember during the, one of the first rehearsals, Stephen Oremus was joking with them because they had done Broadway shows and, and stuff like that. And we were doing our Broadway show. And yeah, I, maybe you know the, 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 how much we were getting paid, but I just remember Stephen Oremus saying, yeah, you know, we're going to start rehearsing and we're going to rehearse with the cast and we're going to get $525 a week. And I was like, yes, I'm rich. <laughs> <laughs> Even though right. <laughs> it wasn't very much money, but I'm like, I'm in New York. I'm making five hundred twenty-five dollars a week. I mean, I'm cool. But back then, it wasn't. You know, five hundred twenty-five dollars now is pretty poor. But back then, I guess it was not that bad. But I was just happy making this this a steady amount of money. But that's how I got connected into the whole Broadway scene. Then I found out. I, I'd like to tell this story too. Maybe I shouldn't tell this story, but I'm going to tell it publicly. Please, I, I, please tell it, tell it. I'm sorry. I'm supposed to be interviewing you. No, nah, but I remember being, they want to hear from you, too. I was on the uh, in rehearsals. I didn't know who Stephen Sondheim was. I think I might have told you this. <coughs> Stephen Sondheim's voice was in the show because Jonathan Larson idolized Stephen Sondheim. And I remember, you know, Stephen. Stephen Sondheim's name kept coming up, and I think I asked Stephen Oremus, I was like, who the hell is Stephen Sondheim? He was like, shh, 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 don't, <laughs> don't, don't say that out loud. So I, I was turned on to who he was. I, I, I did some research and later realized that Sweeney Todd is like my favorite musical now of all time, so far, because <laughs> I just oh, wow. love, the, I love the concept, I love the music. I'm like, I'm starting to become a musical geek now, but I didn't know anything about musicals, but I learned about Jonathan Larson and his influence and Rent and Stephen Sondheim. I'm like, and then this show was tick, tick, boom. It was way bigger than I thought it'd be cool. I was walking down the street with my future ex-wife and people were like looking at us like, oh my God, who, who are these people? It was the opening night party. And I mean, I'm sure you remember some of those parties. They were like, they were cool because cool people were around. I'm like, what did I do mm -hmm. walk into? But now I know. Well, because... that, that was a, yeah, yeah. That, that was a unique show because of the Jonathan Larson, you know, legacy. You know, the, the, the fact that Rent was this huge hit, the fact that, you know, the tragic story of his death, you know, like he he's like theater legend. You know, and I, 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 I just, I'm a huge Jonathan Larson fan. So when when that when that show came, it's like this is the show about Jonathan. Like there was, you know, there was all this buzz around it that I don't think a lot of off Broadway shows often have. You know, a lot of times you tell people about an off Broadway show, and it's not one of those shows that everyone knows. Like you know, the big you know whatever Hello Dolly's and and Miss Saigon's of you know through the years, no one really knows off Broadway other than the Fantastics, which has been on off Broadway for fifty years, whatever it was. And and it also another odd thing that it had that I that I loved for subbing for you on it was it had some like notoriety because of that. And it brought in people like Molly Ringwald be starring in it for a while and Joey McIntyre starring in it for a while, you know, and it was like, yeah. So that, it, that definitely made that show a very unique, special experience. And then I have to thank you for, for, you know, taking some kid you, you had no idea about and subbing the book because two years later when they went on their first national, I, I think only national tour, you know, Stephen gave me the call and said, do you want to do this show on the road? And I was like, yeah, let me take a leave of absence from my teaching job for six months. And and he also said, I know you play piano a little bit. And because it's enough, you know, a small touring production, we, you know, I got to have someone in the band who can also be the assistant musical director, you know, just in case. And and so I ended up getting that position on the job, too. So basically, you know, I played played piano for the excuse me the understudy rehearsals once a week and you know when i never had to play the show obviously um uh, but that and then the best part of that was when the stage managers were calling to get some of my information about two, i don't know two three weeks before the tour started you know it was it was going to be tough for my we had just bought our first house my wife and I, our first condo and here i was like bye honey i'm going away for six months this is where and i guess when she was talking to one of the stage managers um, I guess like, you know, she sounded a little upset, but you know, like, you know, whatever. And, and he, I guess, went back and said to whatever producers, I know we're looking for, uh, someone to do the, you know, to do the, um, merchandise selling on the tour. You should maybe give the drummer's wife a call because she sounds like she's going to be really lonely without, you know, and she came on the tour with me. She ended up being uh... like, you know, out in the, 
she was out in the the lobby every show selling the CDs and the t-shirts and like it was literally like when I think I've done a lot of really cool things I've been very very grateful you know a very um fortunate career but when I look back to like that six months on the road see like you just said seeing the, I, this is the most I've ever seen of our country in one time you know traveling to Dallas, Fort Lauderdale, Michigan, Pittsburgh, uh, you know, all these places we were going to, uh, and having my wife with me and getting paid <laughs> while doing it and getting a little extra because I was the musical, you know, musical assistant musical director. Uh, Randy Cohen was, was, that was Randy Cohen's gig. He was the musical director before he was Randy Cohen, king of Broadway keyboard programming. So he and I, you know, worked on that show together. Um, it was just, the, I still look back at the, and, and the fact that it was like Jonathan Larson's show. Like to me, when anybody ever asked the question, like, you know, what was your f tick, tick, boom, hands down, you know, e not, and I wouldn't say it's an easy show to play, but it's, you know, ba a basic rock show. There's some, there's some, you know, tricky, especially the way you played. Um, no more. I could never yeah. play it the way you played it on the kick drum thing. So I, I, I kind of made my four on the floor version when I, I, I played it your way when I subbed for you and I, I challenged, but, but when I, I, I did my four on the floor version, <laughs> I listened back to that now. I'm like, I, I can't believe I did that. I mean, why did I do that? <laughs> Cause you know, back then I was into was playing rock and playing fast. And when you're young, you can take it. You, you can do all that stuff. Now I'd be like, yeah, boom. I can't play that fast anymore, but yeah, it was a fun, is a fun show to play. Like you said, it was, it I'm was so the, it was the Jonathan, Jonathan Larson connection. The music was great. The story was great. The acting was great. Unfortunately, a lot of people probably don't know this, but you know, we recorded the cast album and I remember going to a cast album, cast album listening party and we were all excited. And I was like, again, yeah, my first cast recording, a lot of people haven't done any of them yet, but I was fortunate enough to have that be my first one. And I listened back to it. Sounds pretty good. And, you know, the uh, record release date for Tick, Tick, Boom cast recording, September 11th, 2001. Yeah, not necessarily <laughs> the best date to do that. And that never happened. And everything kind of went downhill after that. And we closed a couple months later. It was a pretty sad and terrible experience as, as it was for everyone involved in that situation. But going back to your first time subbing, you contacted Billy Mill, Billy Miller from the Miller machine. Great uh, device. What did you do to prepare for that particular show? Wow. 20 years ago, you want me to go back? And, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think anything that, well, for that, yes, the, that was actually the show that Billy did his first prototype of the Miller machine on. So I always love when people are talking about Miller machines, I'm always like, I played on the first one, <laughs> mm. which was super cool. But yeah, so that was an interest. So that's a, that show follies, Stephen Sondheim, as you're mentioning, you know, very, um, very lush music, but also some swing in the original 1970s production. If I remember the story, there was actually two drummers. There was a stage drummer because they're supposed to be like sort of these. It's it's all about this um a, a theater re having a, a you know it's like a, a Follies having like a, a reunion sort of thing and coming back to their old theater or whatever. So in in the story, there's a drummer on stage who's supposed to be like the drummer at the you know the Follies that's happening in the story. And then of course there's the percussionist down in the down in the pit playing the drums and playing the percussion whatever. But for this revival version, as always, space money are issues yada yada. Billy was the only drummer percussionist on that show. So you not only played the songs that were in the score, the songs that you know people know from that show, like Broadway Baby or, or, what, or what have you, there were also, you had just like, you know, brush numbers where you were like sort of a lot, you know, nightclub band, whatever kind of a thing, just the piano, bass and drums played certain songs. Um, and then also, I, I remember vividly, he had not enough room. He was in the pit. So this was in the days when bands were in the pit. and he had a xylophone hung this way on the wall. So instead of playing a flat xylophone this way, we had the xylophone on the right side. You had drum set here, had the xylophone on the wall, which was super challenging. So there was no way that I could practice that kind of thing at home. So, you know, I would set up my, I always, this is always a big thing. I just had a, a conversation with someone recently who was trying to learn a, a Broadway book and was sort of like, you know, 
little maybe a little flip it about like oh yeah i got i got this i'm just going to learn it on my drums and this person had like you know a three piece drum set but the drum set in the theater is like a five piece and i'm like you're you have to set up the way that you're going to be playing you know something something for for damien on jagged little pill you know the, the height difference and the angle difference i heard you talking about for spongebob <laughs> you know that's what i got over here i'm you know jagged little pill is coming back up I've got my snare drum back on that weird angle again to start, you know, getting comfortable with that. But, but so for, for Philly's show, I did the same thing, took pictures, set up my drums as best as I could to be in here. It was, a, it was sort of a simple setup, snare drum, floor tom, bass drum, hi-hat, cymbal, ride, timpani on the left, triangle, a couple of toys here and there, wood blocks, whatever. But the xylophone was always a tough one <laughs> on the, on the wall there. But yeah, back, back in those days, I hate to sound like I'm, I don't, I'm not old, but anyway, <laughs> 20 years ago, you know, taking pictures, bringing my, I don't even know what I would have had at the time to record a show. Uh, you know, probably some handheld cassette player recorded the show. And then, you know, just sort of eat, sleep, breathe that music for, you know, as much as you can. That one, I do remember spending a lot more time in that space. Like I would, you know, back then it was a lot easier to get into the theaters, you know, on off hours or whatever. It was like pretty much come down anytime between nine o'clock in the morning till whatever before the, you know, people start arriving for that performance. So I would, you know, I would play and play on his setup and get comfortable with it. So it was, it was a lot of work for what ended up being one performance, but it, it's what you have to do. You have to put in the hours. You have to feel like a lot of your, you know, in podcasts I've already said for subbing, you have to know the show so that you're not really even looking at the music. Yes, I always have me, I always have the music. I'm flipping pages, I'm reading, but I'm also eyes on the monitor, I, you know, because, and I wanna just know what's coming next. I want it to be second nature. So it's just spending hours and hours and hours of whatever time you have, you know, for someone like me, it was always a little bit harder because during all of this, I had a full-time teaching career as well, and I still do today. So it would be a lot of, you know, work, from you know whatever it was nine to four at my teaching job anytime i had a break put on the headphones just on a pad learn some patterns <laughs> from the show then come home that night in the basement in the garage in the studio wherever and then you know shed it out on the actual setup but yeah it's it, it has it has to be a second nature thing to you you can't be kind of going like what's on the next page oh yeah now I, you know it, it has to be where you know you know what's coming because that's that's what will more than people's playing abilities. When I've heard the horror stories that knock on wood, I've never had as a sub. But it's most drummers are gonna, you know, they're they're not gonna get to that stage unless they're a good player. But the ones who don't get called back are often for that reason. They just did not prepare enough, or they just thought, yeah, this is a pretty, you know, simple tune, straight rock beat, whatever. I'll I'll, I'll glaze over that one. No, you need to put in, you know, hours on hours on each page of that score. Because your job is to come in and make sure that the person who's not there, it's not noticed that they're not there. Right. Like I don't want the cast of Tick, Tick, Boom knowing that Clayton wasn't there that night. I want them to look back when they go like that to give the bows and go, what? Who is that guy? You know, like that, <laughs> that's the goal. Like that's Exactly. The goal. That's one of the things that I had an issue with when I was the drummer for Tick, Tick, Boom. I didn't know really about subbing and what it meant. I would just help people out that's you know i didn't really know you at all and you know i gave you a shot and you knocked it out of the park and people loved you that's why you were asked back over and over again but there were times when i would bring people in and they weren't familiar with what was necessary when it came to becoming a sub for a show and they would try different things and they would approach it in the way that didn't allow them to be asked back because they didn't realize that they had to be a clone of me. So when you go in and sub for another drummer for a show, you basically have to be, uh, you have to do exactly what the drummer does. And you can't be, you know, perfect, but you should be within like 98% of the range where you sound like the, that other person. And that, like you said, it, it takes time to basically internalize that by listening over and over again and just practice practicing along to the recording that you have so that you emulate their sound. So it's important. Yeah. So you go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say you, you were, you were, you're an odd story that you, you know, were able to start landing 
theater where theater work in the city without ever having done like the subbing path first, which a lot of people, you know, start that way. So, you know, when you're a sub, I always, this is my, this is my um, metaphor, being a sub on Broadway or for any, you know, for, for anybody is like being the, you know, the featured actors on Saturday Night Live, because you're working with, when you when, when you start off as a featured actor on Saturday Night Live, you know, you're working with all the regulars who've been there for, for years. Those are the other musicians in the band. And when you're a Saturday Night Live actor, you have to be really good at impersonating characters, right? A lot of times when, when people audition to get on Saturday Night Live, they have to do an original character that they've made up. So like, you know, when Dana Carvey did Church Lady, that was one of his characters, whatever it was. But he also had to be able to do George Bush or whatever, you know, he had to impersonate characters, right? And that's what I always look at drum, like, you know, for the drummers that I've sub for, for example, I mentioned you, Billy Miller, seven for Damien now, the three of you could not be more different you know, in your styles and in your playing when you're when you're the main guy on the, on the book, the main chair, you know, my job is to come in and play like the three of you. And I play when I when it's my own gig different than the three of you guys do. You know what I mean? Like my playing style is not exactly any, you know, anything like either of you. But that's that's the goal is to to go. Well, you know, when Clayton plays. You know, eighth notes on the hi hat. Back then, let's say, into, uh, my, for some reason, this is just something that's popping back in my head. I remember maybe it was just, I don't know if it was your playing style or just the fact that you were in this small Jane Street theater and the vibe. You know, every time you were rocking eighth notes, you were very tip of the stick. And I used to be more shaft to the stick. So it was like, well, not for this show. You know, like I'm not going to play in my comfort zone. I've got to go tip of the stick because whether that's how Clayton always plays or that's how he's playing this particular show, it is my job to do my best Clayton Craddock impersonation. <clears throat> to, to so that you know the show still flows the way and it's for two reasons it's for the other people in the production it's for the other musicians it's for the actors it's for everyone to feel like they're still whatever but it's also for the audience who there may only be this may be their only time ever seeing that show and it's my responsibility as the sub again it's just one small you know piece of the of the you know gear, moving gears of a production being the drummer but I want to make sure that I'm not breaking the show. You know, I want to make sure that the audience and the people that I'm working with are experiencing the same thing that they're experiencing when you're playing the show every night. Like, so that's that for any of you out there that are thinking about like wanting to be a sub, be confident, but don't be like, it's not your, it's not your chair. You have to play the way the drummer that you're subbing for plays. And if you can't do that, this is maybe I probably wouldn't have taken this advice in my twenties but I'd, I'd take this advice in my forties. If you can't do that, don't take that gig. Do, like find another one. Like if, if you, if for example, if Andres happened to call me for Hamilton, I would thank you so much, no way. Cause I cannot play like you. You know what I mean? I'm not saying he ever would, but I'm, I, you know, that I can't play that way. I can't play that way. So, and I know that now. So, you know, that's the first thing subs have to remember is that your, your main goal is to go in there and just lay it down like the person you're you're subbing for. Amen. I feel the same way about <laughs> Hamilton too. Now I don't, I don't think I'd ever be able to play or in the heights. The mis the music is just so it's so cool and so different. I'm I'm not versed on that style. You know, I thought that I wouldn't be able to do other Broadway shows. Like when Bill Lanham asked me to do Evita. I was scared to death because I saw him play Les Mis and I'm like, I can't do that shit. I can't. It's just not in my <laughs> wheelhouse. But I learned Evita. And I was like, you know, there's a song called And the Money Kept Rolling In. It's in seven. I think I told him about it too. I relied on my uh, my years of playing Rush <laughs> and playing Tom Sawyer and that the middle part where it's in seven, I was like, wait a minute, this is the exact same thing. I just used my, my feel to, to figure it out because the way he, you know, and then I, again, I tried to emulate what he was doing because there's some stuff that he did that I never would have thought about. And uh, so I had to like put in a lot of work to play a show like that because again, I'm not really a musical theater type of drummer, even though I can't, I can do it, but I had to like really stretch in order and dig deep in order to try to get that feel right. And just like yourself with, when it came to uh, the first show that you said, what was it called again? Follies. Follies. 
I subbed for Bill Lanham maybe twice. And I was like, man, this is great. Then I saw the musical director lean over to everyone in the cast, I mean, in the orchestra. And she was like leaning over and they were like, oh, she was telling them, yeah, we have six weeks left. I was like, God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> I put in all this work and I'm like, man, this is great. I'm finally doing something totally different. And this show's not going anywhere because, you know, it's a Andrew Lloyd Webber show. But no, you know, some things just don't, don't, you know, happen for a reason. But I'm glad I had that kind of experience. But yeah, you have to make sure that whatever you're going to take on in this, in this scene, you have, the show has to be in your wheelhouse in one way or another, because you're not going to succeed playing something that's not right for you. You went from tick, tick, boom off Broadway to doing the tour. You came back. Did you go back to teaching full time? What was your path after that? So let's see. Yeah, that's 2003. So yep. <clears throat> came back, uh, did this, kept the, the, the I've had to say, I've been teaching the same general music elementary school job from 1998 till currently i'm still there so just took a leave of absence to do that to do the tour came back um i've always been a very active regional drummer so i've uh in that time but starting from about 1999 um i, I worked at this the candlewood playhouse that we mentioned i worked at the barrington stage company for about eight seasons which is up in massachusetts which is a connection to the next Broadway show that I played, which was the, the 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee. We'll come, come back to that in a second. Um, also played at um, the Goodspeed's Norma Terrace Theater. So we had, you know, Goodspeed Opera House is up here in, um, oh man, I forget the actual town and kind of get up there on the river there, kind of get river. But um, they have another theater called the Norma Terrace Theater where they do only new works. Uh, and it was great because those gigs always worked around my teaching schedule. Like I could, you know, again, I sometimes look back and go, how did I do this? But, you know, I'd teach all day, come home, grab, grab a quick bite, drive off to rehearsal for four or five hours, whatever it was, you know, <clears throat> get home 11, 12, one o'clock, alarm goes off at six, back up to school the next day, you know, but, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't know how much I could, well, I still do a little bit of that now, but anyway, uh, you know, in my twenties, I had all that energy to do that. And yeah, I was lucky. I got you know four four seasons out of the out of the Kenwood Playhouse, eight seasons out of Barrington. I think I did six or seven years on and off at, at Norma Terrace Theater up there. So I was doing a lot of regional things. But again, being that our proximity to the city, that's where I always ran into people who would eventually have something going on in a Broadway show or an off Broadway show. So it always it was that's why I, I've heard several of your 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 guests already say like, take every gig you can. And even if it's the, you know, you think it's like, oh, why, why am I doing this? Where's my career going? You just never know where someone you're working with is going to end up and how they may, you know, man, I really need a, a drummer to, oh, maybe I'll call Dennis again. Or maybe I'll call Clayton because we did this thing, you know. it's It seems like it's this impossible career path to take, but it really is a small community of people. There always are openings for other things. But um, yeah, so so back to your to your, the question. But yeah, so I, I kept teaching, kept doing a lot of the regional stuff um here and there and then yeah then around the same time i guess this was 2005 2004 2005 you went on to your next off broadway show altered boys and were well, you were kind enough to call me back again for another round and I, I remember subbing for that for most of that entire run for you and at that same time the 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee was up at Barrington Stage Company where I was the house drummer. Now up there, it was just a piano show. They just had piano and, and the cast, you know. That, that's where the show was developed, was up at this theater in Massachusetts. And the composer, Bill Finn, is the composer of the show uh, Falsettos and A New Brain. We had just done a production of his Falsettos the year before that I was uh, drummed on that one. And I'll never forget the first time I met him, he comes in, hi, I'm Bill Finn, I hate drummers. And it was just like, great, <laughs> this is gonna be awesome. I can't wait to figure out how to play this show and not make you hate me. But um, <laughs> but on that show of falsettos that we did up there, uh, Vadim Feichner was the, was the MD, the conductor, who ended up becoming Spelling Bee on Broadway. 
Wait, so hey, before you go back, before you go on, I lost you here. You said, uh, oh. go back. Somebody, somebody became the something on the spelling bee. Go back again. Yes. Yeah, so, so when spelling bee was up in Barrington stage, and also the Falsettos production, the other Bill Finn show, uh, Vadim Feichner was the uh, musical director conductor up there, and then he took he took the MD chair for the Broadway production of Spelling Bee. So that's another one of these situations where it, for me, it's almost been, I've never known the drummer of the show I'm subbing for, I've known the conductor. And that can sometimes be even more important than knowing the drummer. Because if the, if the, if the conductor says to the drummer, like, okay, Clayton, you're playing, you know, tick, tick, boom, and Stephen Ramos says to you, hey, I know Dennis, we've done three shows together at Candlewood. You're kind of like, for you, that takes a lot of pressure off of you because you already know. Now, I still may, you know, mess up and whatever, but, you know, you know that the conductor is trusting this person already. So that, that panned out for me again, where Vadim called me about two months after, you know, the show opened, Spelling Bee on Broadway, and said, hey, you know, the drummer, Glenn Ryan, who's like Bill Finn's go-to guy, uh, he's played all, like all the, all the cash recordings, falsettos, a new brain, those are all Glenn Ryan, great percussionist. Um, uh, he needs he need some more subs. And I told him about you because we just worked together last year. Do you want to come learn this thing? I'm like, sure. And it was around the same time I was doing Alter Boy. So that was the one time in my career where I had, to, you know, and I, <laughs> I heard you make the same comment to Sean. I can't imagine 11 books at the same time because Two, again, I have a different career than a lot of you guys do. So having teaching and two, you know, a Broadway book and an off-Broadway book at the same time was keeping me super busy and still having those, uh, you know, regional gigs in between here and there. It was a super busy time around around then for me. But yeah, so so that was around that same time I was subbing on both. The, and both of your shows kind of, I think they ran pretty much like like 2005 through 2008-ish, like that, that same three, four, five-year span or whatever it was. Uh, and I was subbing for both of you guys, and that that was keeping me keeping me pretty busy on on both of those shows. Who was the drummer on that show? On Spelling Bee was Glenn Ryan, R H I A N. I think is how he's fucking spelled. I don't know if you've crossed paths with him. He only like in the city. He's really only whenever Bill Finn has a show. Like he's Bill Finn's trusted guy. So when when he you know and he and Bill Finn doesn't have a lot a lot of I haven't I don't think since Spelling Bee he's had another show I think there was a Falsettos revival that they did recently and I I think Jay Mack might have been playing that one though but um yeah uh, Glenn Ryan he he I've crossed I've actually worked with him several times after that uh, just symphony gigs like Ridgefield Symphony Greenwich Symphony here in Connecticut because I've also <laughs> I guess I should mention that one too I was also the principal percussionist for the Ridgefield Symphony. For 20 years from to, from 1996 till just recently um i've never really considered myself an orchestral percussionist but since i had uh and my wife is uh, was uh, was the uh principal pic piccolo player in the orchestra it was it was cool for us to have a gig that we could play together that was local um and and again i always took i always took things from those experiences and sort of weave them into my my theater theater playing but that's uh, I've, I've worked with glenn a couple of times in settings where we've been in the same section. Um, and he was, his, that, <laughs> it's funny. I have, I have a quasi popular, I don't know if it's, well, there's a lot of theater drummers. I'm on one of those musical theater, you know, Facebook pages and a lot of theater drummers um, have been hitting up my YouTube page because I have a musical theater playlist. I just, I post like, you know, drum videos from the pits of shows that I play. And Spelling Bee is one of them because on that cast recording, it is super hard to hear any of the stuff that he's doing, as in most cast recordings, you just, you just can't hear. And it was sort of a textural choice that that show is ma mainly played with hot rods. Like, I don't know if it was specifically a volume thing. I, I remember them saying that that orchestration wanted to sound like it was an incomplete middle school band because the show takes place in a middle school gym. Uh... And so you have this, you have this weird orchestration where it's like the whole band is like piano, keyboards, woodwind doubling, cello, and drums like there's no bass there's no guitar you know so it's kind of like a middle school that just had a random kids you know that whatever that was sort of the the sound they were going for at least that's a story i've heard so don't don't hold me to that you know the orchestrators out there are gonna say no that's that's wrong but but as far as the drum book went you know he played he played most of the stuff on hot rods either for textural choices or for volume um but so you could barely hear anything and so i posted a few videos of just you know here's how it was played on broadway and the thing about subbing that show first day i came in and sat in you know, Glenn Ryan's playing on the songs where he played, you know, 
drum set parts. There was a lot of percussion, mallet stuff too, but you know, I'd like, okay, I'm, you know, doing the thing that I always do, erasing what's in the book and whiting out and putting in what he's actually playing. And then I'd come back and then I'd study with the whatever. Then I come back the second time to watch him a week, two later, whatever. He's playing something completely different, like completely different. And so I go, all right, I'm not going to say anything yet. I'm going to see what happens when I come back my third time, come back the third time. And it's like, okay. So it's like, you know, it's one of those, like, what's that saying? They, they say, like, you know, don't, don't ask for forgiveness, ask for permission. I think as a drum sub, you have to reverse that. You have to ask for permission and not for forgiveness after the fact. So I, yes. I took him in and Vadim Messiah and said, just so, just so I'm cool. It feels like, you know, Glenn is sort of just keeping time. And, and Vadim was like, yeah, just, just do your thing. Just do your thing when, when you're covering the show. And I'm like, in a way that takes a little bit of the pressure off, but at the same time, it adds a whole new layer of pressure because you're like, well, they say do your thing, but what if my thing is not exactly what? Right. So I tried to find sort of a mix of what I had from like three different recordings of Glenn on that show. And, you know, I did, I guess that was one show where I did sort of put a little bit and, and you know, nobody ever complained. I played, you know, sub the show for, for most of the run of the show. So I think it, I think I was, you know, doing my job correctly. But point being is I, I made these YouTube clips and now I get a lot of people love playing that show. It's a hilarious, same thing. It was funny. Alter Boys and Spelling Bee, just two of the most hilarious shows ever. And I was subbing both of them at the same time. And my biggest fear on subbing those shows was not about the playing, was that I was going to miss a cue because I was too busy, like, laughing, dying laugh. Yeah, like, you know, <laughs> laughing from the, from the, the shows were hilarious. But, um, uh, yeah, so it's like subbing that for him and not knowing, you know, if what I was going to do is exactly going to be right. But, like, you know, I sort of just mixed together what, what he was doing and it, it seemed to work. <laughs> Over the years, you've learned many how to play many different instruments, and you've conducted shows, correct? Yes. Now, not, not at the professional Broadway level, but some regional high school ringer gigs here and there, things like that. Yeah. Since you've been on the other side of the podium, what is it that you look for in a drummer for a show? Yeah, oh, so if I'm conducting the show. So if I'm conducting the show, I think it's the two things I always consider for myself as a drummer too. I want to, I want the drummer to be uh, with my tempos. Now, especially for me, for example, the, the, the work that I've done as a conductor or a pianist, I've also done some, some books like a um, high school musical or, or uh, whatever, where I've played piano, guitar and conducted. So playing like a piano, guitar, guitar book and conduct. What I'm looking for is go take, take my tempos, not what you heard on the recording. So this is different than what you guys, you know, when you guys are originating shows and then someone has to come in and sub, that's a different thing. I'm talking about, like, I've done shows where, you know, the shows have existed for years. We're doing it at a high school. We're doing it at a, you know, college, a community theater, whatever. But we're all going to be playing those gigs at some point in our career. And yeah, as a conductor, as a drummer myself, I want to know that I'm not going to be fighting you <laughs> for what, because I'm the one that's been here for four weeks rehearsing the cast. I'm the one that's been here for, you know, four weeks, making sure the director is happy, that the dancers have the tempo that they want. I'm sitting there with my, you know, metronome and writing in the BPM. And yeah, that might not be what you heard on the original Broadway cast recording and what you've been used to or what you want to make it, you know? So I need you to be with me tempo-wise. And then I guess I also want to make sure, depending on the setting that we're playing in, you need to be a dynamic drummer. And Damien is the greatest example. Damien um, Bassman, I, I keep saying his name like everybody knows him, but I think everyone does know him. <laughs> uh, he's the greatest example of somebody who I learned a lot, so much subbing Jagged Little Pill for him. Like how to hit, with, like how to, how to hit, but without breaking people's ears, but somehow it just sounds so huge and solid. And yeah. so I like, I had to sit there studying those, you know, drum cam vids I took of him to study the book and be like, how is he, approach, you know, and then, so I, I'd look for the same thing for a drummer that I want you to play dynamically appropriate for the space that we are in. Like, yes, I know we're doing Tommy, but we're doing Tommy in a hundred seat, you know, cube, you know, like theater where the band is sitting one foot from the first row of the audience number. So unfortunately you can't play it like Luther did on the original recording. You got to play it with that same energy, but you know, and I personally, I, I want the drummer to know how to do it with a pair of sticks dynamically, not with V drums or 
hot rods to like compensate. I want the sound of sticks on drums, but you know, with the dynamics that are appropriate for the space you're in. Damn, you're asking a lot there. I, I know. I'm, <laughs> you know, only because I've been asked to do it myself and I had to find it. You know, it's like, exactly. and then no, when you get, I, yeah, yeah, I'm, when you get I'm just space, joking, but what he's saying <laughs> is true, though. You, you have to, you have to find that balance. And what you said about Damien is so true. His, approach to the drums and the way he gets the sounds out of those drums i'm like how do you do that but that comes with a lot of obviously a lot of practice a lot of great technique and just an approach to the drums where it's very musical not necessarily musical theater but just musical where you 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 get the sound out of the drum and you can you can he has a way of controlling that and that's something that it it takes a lot of time and, and effort and practice and he gives people what they want and that's why mm-hmm. he's he's working so much. Yeah, nonstop. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, what what you just said it, it makes a lot of sense to me, and and people should listen to exactly what you what you said. Now I know that after two thousand nine, you did more stuff on or on Broadway. Or tell me your path. After well, that's the, not quite true. <laughs> okay. So now, for someone, this is going to maybe be shocking to some people, like. How could you have, you know, gotten to that level, you know, and not tried to pursue it more? And for me, maybe it's just because I had so much going on or whatever it was. And, you know, there were a few experiences that, you know, stressed me out for just for my own personal, like, you know, like where I was just like, listen, I know you guys are asking for what you need and you have every right to, this is your show, you know, whether it's the director, the jump, whatever, it, it got a little stressful for me. And so I kind of like gave myself a, a self-imposed hiatus from that, from the Broadway scene. That's when I went, it was in 2008. I think it was right after Alter Boys and, and, and Spelling Bees were, were wait, sort of wait. winding down. Was it because I didn't have you <laughs> on Memphis? Is it, is it my fault? Did I discourage you? <laughs> I, I had, you know, I had some, I had some interesting experiences with some, some, uh, some of the drummers that I was trying to, again, I don't, I don't want to get into it, but it was just for me personally. I, it was definitely not you, <laughs> but it was for me personally. I was like, oh, you know what? I think, I think I've done this. And I, and, you know, I wasn't doing the Broadway thing full time like you guys, but I was doing the theater thing full time, whether it was Broadway, regional touring, high school things, you know, cut, ringer gigs, whatever, plus having a full teaching to, you know, so, so I came to a point right around 2008 where I said, you know, I, I have to do my master's if I want to keep my teaching certificate. And it's been almost 10 years and I, you know, I got, I have to have a master's to keep teaching. So I don't want to let that go. Let, let, one passion I never really followed through on was my passion for, you know, recording and writing music. You know, that was a whole other side of it. You know, back in high school, like I said, I took every music class you can. And the one that was the most fun was, now again, that we're talking mid nineties, I graduated high school in 94. So early nineties, even, you know, we had, a, we had an electronic music class, which was basically like a four track tape player where we learned how to like, you know, record a drum and then add the this, you know, or back in the days when we used to do it with my, with my bands, you know, we would, have a tape player and we'd record the drums and then we'd play that tape player out into another tape player and sing the vocals over it. That's how we multi-track, you know, the, the gorilla way, the ghetto way. But um, I'd always had that passion. And so I was like, well, you know, I went so full in on music. And this is, this, this is where it, it ends up a good, it, there's a happy ending, I guess, is that when I took that break and went back and did something different. So I went back and did this studio composition masters at, at, at um, SUNY purchased, it kind of reignited my passion for pop music again and writing and, and hard rock and all these things that, you know, that theater is always like Warren, Warren Oates said it great, where it's like, you know, this is always going to be musical theater. It's going to sound like musical theater. Even if we're doing Tommy, the Tommy version of, of musical theater doesn't sound like the Who's version of Tommy, you know, like for better or worse. I'm not, it's just, it is what it is. So going back for me, it was like, okay, now I have, I, I can pursue this other passion for a while. And I got into work, independent artists, making a few, you know, uh, independent records and recordings for people, um, <clears throat> playing some more myself, just like I did learning, get, honing my guitar, bass, keyboard skills, doing some more singing, writing my own music. I, I, I started writing my own musical called American Requiem that I did a little like, you know, workshop thing just locally for, you know, so n- nothing that I was ever looking to be a, a true career path change, but it was just, it was a good break from that. And then I would say somewhere between, you know, 
I finished that program in 2010 and we're in 2021. So sometime between now and or 2010, 2018, it was like a little eight year, you know, I kind of went like, okay, let me see if I can start finding my way back to the theater thing. And, and maybe I, you know, maybe I let too much time go by and people aren't going to, you know, they're not going to, there's a hundred other guys that are coming up, you know, whatever. And lo and behold, I, I live um, about 20 minutes from Ridgefield, Connecticut. And the Ridgefield Playhouse uh, is a venue that's been there for, for years and years. They do, they have so many great acts have come through there. Uh, I play, I play, I've played there many times. I've played with Mario Cantone there. I did his uh, laugh horror show with him when it came touring. Um, I played with Bernie Williams there, the, the, the Yankees, uh, you know, who's also a guitarist. I did a couple of gigs with him there. <clears throat> but I went and saw a performance. I don't know why I keep coming back to Tommy, <laughs> but I saw a performance of Tommy that was being done by this group of theater performers who lived in Ridgefield and were going to start their own equity theater. And they were doing some like one one off one night, you know, things at first. Um, and it was uh, an actor director named Daniel Levine, um, an actress producer named Katie Diamond and a music uh, director named Brian Perry. And the three of them all live in Ridgefield. And Ridgefield is oddly this like hub of like, like Stephen Schwartz composer lives there. Alan Menken is somewhere in the area, not at Ridgefield exactly. Debbie Gravitt, Tony Award winning actress in Ridgefield. And I've you know, worked with all of them over the years in some way, shape or form. It's just, it's very strange. So it kind of seemed like they wanted to bring live theater to this area. And I watched, that um and i can never pronounce his name correctly joe who's the drummer on avenue q Ches horshevsky horshevsky there you go see i was gonna mess it up he was playing drums for brian on that production of tommy uh brian was conducting it and i just went like whoa these people are doing like the kind of theater i want to be doing locally without having to go into the city and worry about my you know so i looked up brian and again going back to who you never know who knows who at the time, he was also the conductor of Wicked on Broadway. Uh, and he had been conducting it for about five years. And so ding, 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 in my head, I go, well, then he knows Stephen Oremus and Stephen and I go back 20 years. So God, I'm like, hey, Stephen, let Brian Perry know this guy, Dennis, in his area that would love to work for his theater and yada, yada, yada. Stephen came through for me and texted Brian. Brian and I got together and had a, had a lunch, hit it off right from the minute. And he was basically like, well, listen, I don't really know any musicians in this area. So you can be my house drummer. You can be my contractor and hire the bands. And you can be my keyboard synth drum programmer, since you mentioned those are all things that you do. And I was like, cool. Uh, so this was 2017 when I first met them. And then in the uh, summer of 2018, we opened a Contemporary Theater of Connecticut, or ACT of CT, as we go by now. Uh, and I've been their resident uh, house drummer, programmer, contractor since then. And that was sort of my gateway back into doing the professional theater thing again. And then that's what led back to finally now being back uh, subbing on a Broadway show because Brian Perry is the conductor on uh, Jagged Little Pill. And when that was in its out of town tryout out in, in Boston, wherever it was, he kept saying to me, hey, listen, you know, you've, we love you at ACT. You, you're a great drummer. Do you know, do you know Damien? I'm like, yeah, I, you know, we're friends on Facebook. We've, we've crossed paths. I actually met Damien years ago. He, his sister, Nilly, I think her name is Nilly. Sorry, Damien, if I'm saying her name. Um, he, uh, she was in a production of St. Uh, Stephen Sondheim's Follies, oddly enough, that I played at Barrington stage. And Damien had been in the audience. He was coming to see his sister. And he reached out to me like, hey man, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a drummer in the city. I just, I heard you playing, you know, stay in touch, you know, stay in touch. And I was like, oh my God, yeah, of course. And I did, a, I did like a, a rehearsal for Martha Plimpton for him one time. You know, he was like stuck and needed something. So we never really crossed paths, you know, doing the theater thing. But um, <clears throat> Brian said, you know, well, you know, tell Damien that I said, I'd like you to, you know, try to sub on the show. And so again, not knowing the drummer personally, but having paid my dues, you know, for, for Brian, the conductor kind of led me back to being able to hopefully start this like second round of my <laughs> Broadway subbing career. So I'm looking looking forward to you know things reopening again next month and getting back to doing that. I'm actually going to be playing a few rehearsals for for Damien and the reopening because he's got some schedule conflicts. So that'll be checking off a bucket list for me. I've never actually you know played a Broadway rehearsal like all you guys do. You know, starting off at the studio. So I'm looking forward to doing to that. But yeah, so I, you know, I just I needed a little bit of a break from the 
I've always been really good with handling pressure. I don't think that's a problem for me, but the pressure's there. We all know it's there. And sometimes when you don't, have, I was very fortunate that I didn't have to depend on this career being my full-time, you know, salary or whatever, you know, like, like, so I just was able to say, let me step back from it a little bit. And now it kind of reinvigorated me to want to get back to doing it again. So it, it's been nice to kind of have that, re- have that return. When you started to sub for Damien at Jack Little Pill, did you sub? I, I can't remember how long was open before everything shut down. Did you get a lot of shows in? Yeah. So I, you know, I had just finished up. A, we were doing a production of Little Shop of Horrors here at, at ACT. I think it was October of 2019. And that Jagged Little Pill was going into previews around in November of 2019. So I went in and as soon as I could, you know, he was already sending me, it was, it was interesting to be a part of a show before it officially opened because all the other shows I've subbed, I, you know, it was after they opened, I was one of many other subs, you know, whatever it was, but it was cool. Cause I was getting, you know, PDFs as they were getting reorchestrated. It was like, you know, here, start, start learn, make sure you have these. So I had the whole book printed out in my hand before I even went and saw the show. So November of 2019 went in. Now this, this was a, an odd situation. This is something for people to know. You never know what your, um, auditing situation is going to be like you know subbing for billy on spelling or um follies i was able to sit in the pit right behind him watch the show you know whatever subbing for you on tick tick boom and altar boys both being on on stage band on very small stages i remember having to sit in the house with my book and like a flashlight and the audience person sitting next to me must have been like what is this person doing like watch the show and you know trying to learn the show that way uh, spelling bee I was on stage band, but sort of under a loft. So I was able to sit with them. But for Jagged Little Pill, the band is on these two like rolling platforms the whole show, and there's no room up there. And there's no room to like be anywhere where you can visibly see what's going on. So you have to audit the show down in the band's dressing room, down in the basement. They have an AV on there for you, and they have a conductor cam and a, and a screen uh, stage cam. So I can see Brian conducting and I can see what's happening on stage, but I can't see Damien at all. So I had to set my little uh, GoPro camera on his ride cymbal uh, and I recorded a, a drum cam video on, of him so that I at least could have a reference of how he's doing everything. Um, so November through December, I think they opened December 3rd of 2019. And I got a call uh, over the like Christmas break from school. My mom happened to be in town from Wisconsin and he's like, hey, can you play January 2nd for me? And I was sort of, you know, learning it, but I hadn't like really like, I wasn't you know ready, ready. So this was like, maybe like a, I had about a week and, I was, and you're not going to say no. So I'm like, yeah, of course, of course. And my poor mother who was here visiting me for the holidays had to listen to Jagged Little Pill being bashed around in this studio for like, because I was just like, now I got to go into like, you know, performance mode. Um, but yeah, I ended up getting in there four times. I had four, four performances I played before the shutdown happened. So I was just starting to get comfortable with it. I had just been designated. So for those of you that don't know, if I'm trying to help our listeners out there. <laughs> so when you're a sub on Broadway, there's a process. And my mom actually asked me this. Well, she's like, well, who decides if whether you can you know, stay? Is it the drummer? I'm like, actually, it's, it's a conductor. So your you know, drummer preps you. You prep. You do your work. It is the craziest. I always say, I, I remember you saying that one of, the, one of your drummers that it's like a two and a half hour heart attack I, I i think subbing broadway shows is like jumping on a moving train because you have something that's a well-oiled machine and now you're that one <laughs> you're that one and you're a pretty integral part i mean drummers are drummers you know like, yeah, it's, like it's like jumping on that moving train then you have to like drive it <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> it's no pressure so yeah yeah With but passengers on board expecting to get to where they want to go and they paid a lot of money right. <laughs> and unlike the understudies or anybody else who at least gets a, a, a piano rehearsal or mm-hmm. a run through whatever, it's like you're the audience, they're paying customers are there and hope you did your homework. Now for this one, since, since it was Brian, it was, it was a weird experience. It was literally like, you know, two minutes before curtain, Brian's not even there at the conductor. He just shows up. He's like, Hey Dennis. And, and we go, and I'm like, cool. <laughs> you know? And luckily for me, it went good. It went well. I had done my homework, but, um, uh, so designation, of, designation. Yes, thank approval. you. Yes. So after that first date, if everything goes well, the um, the conductor approves you. Approving means you're you're you did your homework. Maybe you had a flub or two. The nerves got you at your first show. As long as it wasn't a train wreck, 
you've been approved, you get a second chance, you can come back. After you've done now, but as you're subbing, the rest of the band cannot be subbing out yet. You've got to be working with the, the at least most of the contracted musicians. You know, there's no other subs in the pit with you when you're playing your first shows. Um, and then once you've gone through uh, for this for Jagged Little Pill, it was that third or fourth performance where I became a designated sub, which now means that I'm designated, I can sub whenever. So if there's 10 other subs in the band, it could be their first times, they could also be designated subs, but I've at least gone through that process of making everyone feel comfortable. Like he knows the show, he's gonna, he's, you know, he's solid, he's good to go, you've been approved, you've been designated. So luckily for me, I, you know, I've, I've already gone through that phase. I think that's the only reason why I'm able to help Damien out for some of the rehearsals. Um, is that, you know, I'd already, I know the show, I've been working it back up in here, you know, over the past couple of weeks, trying to you know, get it back in shape. Um, and yeah, so that, that's the process we go through to, to be able to have that job as a, a running gig. There are times where people never get designated, never get approved, but keep coming in. It's a weird situation. And there are people that come in on the first day, they're approved and designated. So it depends on how, you know, your relationship with the conductor, how the conductor may feel about you or your relationship and, of course, how you do and how everyone else in the pit feels about you. So there's a lot of variables that that come into play when it take when it comes to being approved and designated. It's a very interesting thing. Uh, do you have to do that in regional theater as far as designation and approving and then how's that work because i've never done sure yeah so the, for the regional theaters that i've worked for it's been a mix of union and non-union gigs so um the union gigs will be a little bit stricter obviously um i've never experienced any kind of approval or designation with subbing um but definitely if someone brings in a sub like for example sometimes a person let's say we're doing a four week run, you know, it's a, it's a, not an open ended. It's, it's a four week run. We're doing eight shows a week, five shows a week, whatever it is, you know, limited, limited amount of performances. And the person that's hired, you know, really wants to do it, but has this one conflict on the third Saturday night. All right, cool. We've got enough time for you to record the show, prep your sub, give them a copy of the book. It's that one day we cross our fingers. We hope that person sits in and, you know, at least if they can, again, a lot of these jobs are not paying enough for, you know, people to, you know, sit in and whatever. It's just, you would trust that they're, you know, professionals. Um, but if that sub is going to be there more than once, we, we usually do, you know, say, okay, listen, we're letting the, the, the contracted player know, like, okay, if this sub is not good, make sure you've got a second or a third ready for you because we don't want to have someone, you know, it, especially for a limited run, our audiences and our reviewers are only going to have so much time to see our show. We want to make sure that every performance is, is as best as it can be. So yeah, I've never, I've never really run into having a, an official process like that, but there's always those little unofficial things that, you know, being a contractor myself now, it's been, it's been interesting, you know, working with ACT. Now I'm part of those, you know, pre-production conversations and the conference calls. And I've never, you know, usually I was just a drummer for the shows. <clears throat> so it's been kind of nice to be like part of the, the business side of it and learn a whole nother, a whole nother realm of it. And that's one of those conversations we have is like, you know, if people are going to be subbing, whether it's the drum chair or, you know, the guitar chair, we just want to make sure that that person is prepared. And if they're not, we reserve that right to say, Hey, you got to find someone else because at the end of the day, this may just be a little side gig for you, but we're, we're trying to run a theater. We're trying to run a business. We want to keep, you know, we want to keep it open. Um, so we want to make sure we have the best people that we at, at all times. So, when people want to become a theater drummer, become a pit musician, what do you think they should always do uh, when it comes to either preparing for a show or just being getting into in, into theater in general? What do you what what kind of advice would you give? Well, if if people are have been following this podcast, I think, and again, I, I've known a lot of the the drummers you've talked to. I've either worked with them, met them, sat in with them. I hope people are finding out that there's one thing that everybody has in common. And that is being humble about what you do and not being arrogant about your abilities. So you need to be confident. You're the drummer, right? The drummer, it, it, you're going to notice if the drummer is not prepared. You know, you have to be confident, but you can't walk in like, your you know what doesn't stick you know what i mean like you have to remember that you're just one piece 
a, a many pieces moving puzzle that, you know, that you have to be able to be confident without being arrogant. So I always tell people with, with, with theater stuff, you know, if you want to be, you know, whatever it is, be showy drummer that's doing master classes on your specific way of play, then, you know, like, like a Dave Weckl or whatever else kind of, you know, this is not, this is not that scene. This scene is about coming in, doing your homework, whether, whether you're a sub or whether you're the, you know, I don't, I obviously can't speak from being a Broadway chair, but I can speak from being a regional chair when it's, when it's my chair, I got to do my homework. I got to come in. I've got to communicate with the conductor. I've got to give, I've got to meet their needs first. And then if I create a good relationship, I can try some stuff and I can say, again, I'll, I'll go back to Avita, which you mentioned. I played that show at Candlewood when I was 20 years old and pfft, I have, I have like a, a, a board recording of that show and I listen back to it now and I'm like, whoa, like, you know, I sound like a 20 year old playing that show, but it was, we did it here at, um, ACT back in 2019, uh, 18, one of our first shows. And to revisit that show 20 years later and coming at it with a, you know 20 years experience and playing it again, it was like, okay, now I know how to be a better drummer because back then when I was 20, you know, I thought, yeah, I'm the 20 year old playing on the show. I know what I'm doing. And I, I wasn't arrogant in my attitude, but I might've been a little bit arrogant with what I was trying to play in the show. But now come back to, you know, to playing it now, now I have a little bit more experience. I have a little bit better, you know, understanding of what I'm doing. And it's about now I have, I have the trust of the people I work with. Maybe I can try some things now. And if someone likes it, I'll put it in the ink and I'll play it every night. And if someone's like, yeah, no, that doesn't work. Then you have to be able to say, no, I'm going to try it a different way or just play what was originally there or, or what have you, depending on the situation you're in. So yeah, so always, never, never try to come in and think that, you know, you're the most important person in the room. You know, drum, I think drummers sometimes, I know myself, I'll sometimes, you know, I'm the drummer, man, I'm the drummer, you know, like, it, but you, you're the drummer in musical theater. Like there's, there's a caveat to that. It's not, you're the drummer. You're not, you know, I don't think I've ever seen a show where, you know, Tommy Lee was one of my, at least love, you know, the, the, the floating drum booth that, you know, that's not going to happen in theater. <laughs> you know, you're, you're not going to be the center of attention. Unless, for that and, long. You, unless the, you're on Jersey Boys. It, don't say it. Oh, that's true. I thought and you were going to say, the unless drums they make Motley like... Crue the musical. <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey, see? Yeah, I'm not going to say, I, I think I said this on one of the podcasts, I'm not going to reveal <laughs> any of my my thoughts about future shows. I said, you know, this should be a, uh, a 2112 musical. I'm going to put that out there. And I said that to an actual, uh, someone who works as a producer. And he's like, man, you know, I'm a big Rush fan. You know, that's a good idea. We should talk about that. But now, are you confident enough that you'd be the drummer on that? Absolutely not. Joe okay. Ber <laughs> Joe Bergamini is going to be the drummer. He knows it. I think I might have said this on Facebook. It's like, dude, you're it. Because people are like, who should be the drummer on that show? And people are like, Joe Bergamini. Joe Bergamini. So I've never seen him play. I just know he knows uh, Neil and, you know, he's studied him. And he's he's like the, the Rush God. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, Molly Crew musical. What would that be called? <laughs> It'd be called Girls, Dr. Girls, F Girls. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Do Doc, girls, 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 girls. Dr. Feelgood, no. Dr. Yeah, Feelgood, Dr. Feelgood, the musical. And now you're talking. It could be about some kind of, uh, you know, doctor that, you know, heals people. And, you know, it could be, I don't know. But we should discuss this. Mm. What do we talk to? We, we talk to Ty. And then, are you going to be the drummer on it? Or is Sean McDaniel because he loves oh, Molly Crew? Right? I defer to Sean. I think his resume is <laughs> like, I'd like to think I could play that one, but I uh, know. Uh, then we can have the drummer, you know, be on the thing, and it could go around. I'm telling you, man, we're here. We're we're making money. Do anybody <laughs> steal this idea? Even though this is public, <laughs> we got the rights. I just call. Hold on, I'm gonna call Tommy Lee. Tommy, Tommy. I wonder who. No, it's, you know, what, you know what, here's a here's a funny Tommy Lee thing though. This this is one of those like, again, just so that everyone knows how small this community of like musicians are. So like. Tommy Lee was definitely one of my drumming influences as a guy. Not that I could play like him, mm -hmm. but I just I loved watching him. I wish that you know I wanted yeah, I loved Molly Crew stuff. So you know, and and I and I'm like the, the most up like I never had. This is the longest my hair's ever been in my life. <laughs> I'm not like no tattoos, no drinking and drugs, and like you know. So it was never. I just I don't know. Just loved his style. So fast forward in college, I uh, one of my. Uh, um, classmates uh his name is steve morrison 
we, we, you know, we hit it off. We played, he actually played in that same senior recital with Matt Beck with me. He played some, some mallet stuff for me. He went on to become Tommy Lee's drum tech really? on the road. And then went on to become Nate Morton's drum tech on The Voice, the NBC show The Voice for years. Oh, wow. And I've stayed in touch with him, Steve. He goes by Steve-O now. And he um, he builds um, snare drums now. DTS, it's drum tech services are snare drums. And I had this, I have a custom snare drum back here that he made for me. But it's, again, it was like one of those times where I just went, man, this thing, this community is really small. Like someone I went to college with became the tech, you know, the, the drum tech for like the drummer that I wanted to be one day. That's you know, so, cool. and, and he, and he, Tommy has a drum made by Steve and I have a drum made by Steve. And that's just like, I, so oh, I remember what it was. he texted me one day, Steve, and he goes, look, you and I've been texting back and forth and look, I, he screenshot his text messages and it's like me texting him and Nate Morton and, and Tommy Lee. And I'm like, I'm on the same screen as these guys now. <laughs> like just, that's, that's enough for me. Like that was, that was just so cool. But yeah, it's, it, it is strange how many, it's just a small community of, of musicians out there doing stuff which is so you know once you can get into it and you can meet a few people you know you just have to be be someone that people like to work with and just yes. don't turn people off with your attitude playing is one thing a lot of your guys have said this on the podcast playing is one thing obviously you got to be a good player you're on it you're never going to get called back if you're not a good player but you also have to be someone that people can at least connect to talk to feel like you know we can have a conversation with so you know I, I feel I'm a bit of an introvert. I'm not always the most best, you know, small talk person, but when I'm in those working situations, I want to, I want to step out of my comfort zone and make people feel like, you know, you're not, you don't have to feel uncomfortable with me. So that's another plus for people to do. <laughs> Speaking of gear, what kind of gear do, do you use and why? So uh, drum wise, I've had the same Pearl export, 1989 drums for however many years now going over the, over 30 years now right yeah wow um and i mean i think those drums are a lesson in know how to tune know how to you know buy good quality heads i use remo i've always been a fan of remo finally going back to like just you know good old coded ambassador after going through all of them i'm just i'm back to like remo coded ambassador i think i've got some aquarians on them right now but I've used these on recording sessions. I've used them on, you know, professional shows and they sound awesome because, you know, I, I've learned over the, they didn't always sound awesome. I had to learn, I had to learn how to be a, you know, a better drum tuner and just to get things to have better overtones and just get good sound out of it. But uh, always been a fan of my, my Pearl drums. The other one behind me here is my only other drum set I have is a custom AOT drum set, which I bought in 1996, uh, actually for that Avita gig <laughs> on Canwood was the first time I bought this drum set. I was like, I think I need to step up my AOTs now that I'm starting to do professional work. So the the uh, uh, drum shop in Norwalk, Connecticut, where I live, Norwalk Music was owned by a drummer <clears throat> and he was on the AOT kick long before a lot of other people were. And he had like a ton of the sets sitting around there. And I just was like, I always like seeing like, well, no one knows what this is. I like to try something that people aren't familiar with. I sat down on that jump set and I was like, yep, I'll take them. <laughs> they were just, they were awesome. So, so uh, Pearl drums, AOT drums, uh, Zildjian uh, K cymbals have always been my go-to just for no other reason than they, I, the drummer who I played with in middle school had Zildjians. And so when I started by, I just bought Zildjians too. So that, they've just always, they've, they've never let me down. I've played Peisty, I've played Sabian. I've just always come back to Zildjian's. I, I really enjoy them. Uh, Vic, Ver, Vic Firth sticks most of the time. Um, yeah, I mean, there's the thing is, I think with with there's a lot of good products. I don't think there's like you know one that we can say like, you know, oh you have to use Pro, you have to use Yamaha, you have to use. There's some just just find the one that fits the sound that you're looking for. What's the most difficult show that you've done, and why? In, in the city, like Broadway, or or or. In general, in general, both, <laughs> um, probably West Side Story, mm. because it was not in my wheelhouse stylistically with all of the Latin stuff, um, and I actually pl I've played both books of that show. So the original show, like when you get the MTI one now, I think it's like a now you know printed score. But when I was when the times that I played it, it was back when it was still like the handwritten version of it, and. It can be done with two percussionists if you know how to split it up correctly. 
And so there was a, a teacher colleague of mine, he and I have done the show a bunch of times together. But the first few times I did it, I played the percussion book. So it was all the timpani, xylophone, mallets, bongos, congos, you know, all that stuff. And it was, it was just like, whoa, that was, you know, not, it was, it was just, especially the, um, it's the song Cool. It has like the, the, the canon section and there's like the vibe riff that the vibraphone riff that everyone plays in canon with each other. And it's just super, took me forever to learn that one. But it was like one of those pat myself on the back moments when I finally got it, like, yeah. And then a few years later at Barrington Stage, the, the theater I played with up in, in Massachusetts, we did, and I played the drum book to it. So again, just playing all that swing and Latin stuff was definitely, you know, I was a, an 80s rock kid. So that was always easier for me to do. So again, when, when I always feel accomplished when I can do something outside of my, out of my comfort zone. Um, in the city, I would definitely say that the current Jagged Little Pill um, is deceptively hard to play because we all know Alanis Morissette's music. 98% of the songs are in 4-4 time. Uh, but A, the way that Damien plays and the parts that he writes are super hard to learn. And when I watched him, I was like, yeah, okay. And I see it on paper. I'm like, yeah, okay, cool. And then the first time I sat down to try to play along with the track, I was like, oh man. Cause he, you know, he does, he, he'd got his sort of his niche where he's got the djembe on the left hand and he may be doing like sweeping 16ths on the brushes on the surgeon, which is not something I do very often, but you know, I definitely am way better at it now cause I had to learn it, you know? So doing that simultaneous, I remember he talked about like making it so that you were the, you were the loop and you were the drummer at the same time. That, that definitely, difficult on top of the fact that you're also stopping and starting all of the click tracks. So the drummer is in charge of all of those. Uh, so you got two pads for that. There's a few little electronic things. He's got like electronics on um, uh, one of the songs has like Indian tabla drums on it. And those are on there. There's like some chimes, whatever, not too much in electronics, but, and then there's a, a field drum for this one uh, protest piece that they do. So you got a little bit of, so his, that show has like a little bit of everything in a pop show like you know like there's not like a latin song or a jazz song but his feels sometimes there's a song unsexy that's one of alanis's songs that when you hear the original has does have a little a little swing to it but the drums play very you know the eighths are the eighths are constant constant but the the you know the 16th kind of swing and so he he puts a little bit of that shuffle in there that makes that song tricky to play you know it's, it's little things like that have made it oh i just love telling this story though for anybody who wants to get in touch with damien to sub a little pill just keep this one in mind since you don't get to see the show until you're playing it like literally you know like you don't get to experience what these moving stages whatever and the lights and whatever and that's all cool and it is really cool to like see the house when you're all on stage i was fine with all of that but there's this moment and i i i guess i just couldn't tell from watching the drum cam video there's a moment after the actress who sings you ought to know lauren Patton. she tears down the house every night standing ovation you're waiting there for like three minutes to get ready to go on the next song the the, the they start the band riser starts sliding off and they start the song uninvited and you hit one of these like chords and it's just you know like everyone's making noise you know cacophony just blah blah blah, 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 blah. and and through that you start a click track with your free hand and then we count into the song but what i didn't know was that there's a complete blackout on stage at that point so uh, my first show subbing it, ha that was definitely my, your friend said a two and a half hour heart attack. I had my like five second heart attack for, for real there. I, I hit the chord and I, I cannot see, I cannot see the pad that I have to start this click track for. And I'm like, in my head, I'm going, oh boy, fired on the first gig. This is going to be great. Somehow I, I, I got it. Everything went off smoothly, you know, so Another note to everyone is be prepared for the things you can't be prepared for because there will be something that you have to whatever. Yes, so, will. so my second show back, I text Damien after and I go, I left you a present and I had put a, I put glow tape on that pad now just for myself. <laughs> so that when I'm covering it, when we go into that blackout, I'm just like, Oh, there's the pad. Perfect. I can start the click track. Yeah. That was definitely like a, a lost my, you know, like sense of self for a minute. Like, where am I? <laughs> Yeah, there are times where you're going to freak out because there's so much riding on what you do. When I was subbing for him at SpongeBob, you know, I had to change the the pad with my left foot in addition to playing the hi hat. And then there was a then if you didn't change it to the right thing, it might go, you know, too far forward. And you don't want to do that because it was just so much stuff I had to think about. Then you had to play with the pad. 
be comfortable <laughs> in your when you sub a show. You have to be so confident in what you're going to do so that those situations that come up, it'll be less of a, uh, I mean, uh, I guess I, I, I got to think about how to say this. You have to be really, really comfortable when you're going to sub for somebody and you have to be uh, really sure about yourself because there will be times where you're going to start thinking about pushing a certain thing at the wrong time and screwing up the whole show, screwing up the whole show. So, um, again, I, I, I don't know. I mean, you, everyone else has said this, said it much more eloquently than I am right now, because I'm, 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 I'm thinking of, uh, the next thing to ask you, to be honest with you. <laughs> Go ahead, man. Go ahead. ask. But yeah, be confident in what you do. So, um, what kind of projects are you working on right now? Uh, right now, so uh, I'm looking, uh, doing the, some subbing for Damien in the fall, uh, doing the uh, some rehearsals for Jagged Little Pill reopening. So that's kind of cool. Uh, uh, ACT is at the start of our fourth full season right now. So I'm contracting for them. Uh, we have Smokey Joe's opening in October. I'm not playing that one, uh, but I contracted and did the programming for that. And we have, um, we're also doing a, a, a brand new debut musical called Nickel Mines, um, which is about the Amish school shooting in, in Pennsylvania. It was supposed to have opened on, it was supposed to open March whatever of 2020, and we, we had to can it. So we wanted to bring this company back to, to, do, their, to do their premiere. So we have that one in January uh, that I'll be contracting for as well. And then we're also doing Jesus Christ Superstar in May. And then we're ending our season in, sorry, in March of 2022. Uh, we're ending our season with Rent, which is the show that I credit me being in theater f because of. <laughs> so I'm playing that one. I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm contracting myself right now to be playing that <laughs> joint book on that one. Uh, so I'll have that season to do. Um, and then, well, all right. So I can't, I guess I shouldn't make a, Maybe we can do, I don't know if anyone's interested in my playing, but <laughs> maybe we can do a follow-up for your, uh, for your um, you know, subscribers on your Broadway drumming. Cause I, I have two projects that are still in contract negotiations that I, that have not been made a public press release yet. So I can't really say anything right now, but I will have, a, I do, I do have a cast recording coming out. Uh, and I do have a show that will be streaming on one of the like Netflix Broadway HD things there. So I'm finally getting to check those off my list of like being able to say like, you know, like when people say 50 years from now, I'm studying Clayton Craddock's playing on Tick, Tick, Boom so that I can play that show. There, there might be a show that someone might get to listen to me play 50 years from now, but I'll, I'll have to follow up with you on that when, when all the contracts are signed and all of that. So, yeah, so I do, I do have a couple of uh, recording projects as well that are that are coming out in the next year. But That's yeah, great. so and still teaching. So keeping me busy <laughs> now you teach where again you teach middle school i high teach school? In, i teach hey, get ready for this i teach kindergarten through fourth grade general mm. music in bethel connecticut uh i've been at the same job since i graduated um from west con in 1998 it was about yeah i graduated in may of 98 and i had the job in august of 98 um yeah i mean it's general music is so like for those of you know it's you have your band classes, you have your orchestra classes, you have your, you know, choir classes. But in the, in the younger grades, you have the general music class, which is usually part of a, a specials rotation. You might have gym, you might have PE, you might have um, art, media, library, computers, and music. So I'm, I'm the teacher that gets every student in the school. It's not an elective, it's a required course. Uh, and I see them from kindergarten through fourth grade. Um, I use this really cool online uh, music curriculum called Quaver Music which is um, uh, basically a curriculum that has everything you need for teaching. You know, it teaches music theory, it teaches performance. We use lots of rhythm instruments in my classroom. We do singing. And obviously this past two years with the pandemic has caused a lot of issues in schools and virtual learning and trying to do things with masks and we're, we're figuring it out and things are, we're like, we're not back to normal, but you know, we're still in my district and we're still masking up and, and uh, we still have to like space kids out, you know, a certain amount of distance and stuff. And it creates, creates some issues. But I think it's one of those things when people say to me, like, you know, how old are you? And I'm like, yeah, I'm 45. It's like, yeah, Yo, you don't look 45. You don't act 45. I'm like, well, just 
try hanging around five to eight year olds for eight hours a day. <laughs> and you just, you have to find, you have to find like those, you know, moments in life that are like, let's not be too, you know, like, let's, let's look at things through those kids eyes every once in a while. And it kind of puts things into perspective for you sometimes. So I definitely, I definitely, that's why when people always said to me like, well, you know, you have this career as a musician too. Like, why don't you go and pursue that? And I always say, this is just me. That, that side of my career has always been a very, I don't want to say selfish, but it's something I've, I've done for me, like, you know, playing and whatever. And I feel being a teacher is something I can do to inspire the next generation, right? It's something I can pass on more to other, you know, to other human beings, hopefully find a love of music and get, and it is great. And, you know, I've been teaching so long now that I have, I, like, I have colleagues who were students of mine, <laughs> like they've come back and become yeah. educators and, I was gonna ask and or they have kids. Yeah, and I or I have or I have kids of former students. Well, uh, that's so weird. But um, but it's so cool when they'll say to me like, "Oh, Mr. Arcano, you know, I remember when we did this, you know, holiday concert or whatever it was, you know, or when we played the recorder or like whatever it was." And it's just like, that's just so cool that you like leave a lasting memory with someone, and it's in music. You know what I mean? Like they're not going to remember taking their SATs. They're not going to remember doing their standardized testing. The stuff that we that we say is important in education they're going to remember those experiences that that made an impact on them and I'm, I'm always so happy to know that i can be a part of that for for a child and when they become an adult well you can retire now right no nah, not yet <laughs> <laughs> not if i want that full pension so is it 25 it, years no in connecticut they drain you it's 30 the max you can go is 37 and a half years i don't know what? why that half year Yep, that's where you can receive your 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 full pension. Uh, but once you've taught 15 years or more, you start grandfathering into a certain level of of pension. So, like for those of you who care, <laughs> uh, if I retired now, I could start collecting a pension when I'm 65, but it would only be at a 50% rate, as opposed to if I go to you know. 30 years, it would be at a 60% rate. And if I go to 35 years, it would be at a, you know, so that's why they max you at 37 and a half years. Basically they double the years. So 37 and a half years get you to a 75 and a half, um, a 75% pension rate uh, in the state of Connecticut. So. You gonna make it that long? You I like don't it? know. Uh, I like it. It's just, I don't know if it's the world's changing, but you know, it's it's changed a lot. It's not the same job it was. I mean, I guess nothing is. The world is the same that it was 10, 15 years ago. So it's just, it's it's a little more exhausting now than it ever used to be. Mm. Um, again, I'm older, that, that could be part of it too. But yeah, I mean, I do, I, like I said, I do like being able to inspire the next generation of musicians. I like being able to pass on my knowledge to, you know, of what, what I do have to, to, to share with children and try to get them, you know, I wanna keep the arts alive and that has to happen somewhere. You know, so I, I like, I definitely like that part of it, but yeah, I mean, I haven't quit yet. So I, I feel like I'm probably just gonna, I'm, I'm one of these like very, um, what term can I use? Me, I'm a very, like, I'm a dedicated person. Like I just, when I, when I'm in just like, I've been at the same job. I've been married for 22 years. I just, I like to see things through. <laughs> I like to, you mm. know, I'm a dedicated person. So my career is just another one of those things where I'm like, yeah, I'm going to, and I, and again, knocking on wood, haven't had to do some of the corporate things or day jobs. Like, you know, I hear people talk about, so I'm just, it's just another way of, I never say to people, I'm a music teacher or I'm a drummer. I always say I'm a musician and that everything I do is connected to that. Like I, I, I'm a drummer in theater. That's part of my job as a musician. I am a public school music educator. That's my, it's a part of my job as a musician. You know, that's just how I've always looked at it. One last question. Where can people find you? Um, uh, well, I'm on the musical theater drummers page on uh, Facebook. I, I often try to post some things there or answer questions for people. Uh, my YouTube channel, which I guess is whatever, you know, uh, Dennis J. Arcano, A-R-C-A-N-O. I've got a, uh, I think it's a pretty cool musical theater playlist there where I do some videos, you know, from ACT and my drum booth. Uh, I've actually got some Tick, Tick, Boom national tour footage on there. So people could check that out. It's a horrible, <laughs> it, it feels like it's like the Zapruder film from the 60s, <laughs> even though it was 2003, because back then those high eight cameras, whatever we had, you know, it's like super granny, whatever. And all you can hear is like snare drum and hi-hat and singers. Like you can't really hear anything else because it was like in the house. But um, I did a cover version of um, my favorite song from Jagged Little Pill where I played the entire orchestration myself. 
sang the sang the female lead part, which was probably hilarious. So if you want to check that out, but uh, yeah, YouTube is usually my place where I, I have a lot of uh, some of my own personal work is there. My my uh, solo album, which was based on Stephen uh, Stephen King's Dark Tower series series, is up there. I did sort of a concept prog rock thing. Uh, cover songs that my wife and I have done are up there. So yeah, YouTube is just sort of my, my jam for social media. You have a website? I do not. Ah, interesting. No. Never, never wanted one? No. So never, never got into it? No. Okay. No. I, yeah. I don't know. I, I've been, again, I've been lucky enough to keep a career going without that. And, you know, I guess for me, <laughs> this is going to sound self-deprecating, I guess. I never thought I was like, important enough to have a but you know what i mean like i don't like like you're clean you're clean you've done you're like you've got a broadway career you're like so you got a website that makes sense people want to find out about you know i've never felt that i i that i don't well, know who knows gonna, who knows me we're gonna start one now after this podcast okay. <laughs> amazing <laughs> you are now important actually you've been important for for many many years so oh you're, you're too kind man important to the, the kids that you've you know mentored uh, yeah. and you know your family and people that you work with and you have this regional theater uh credential man yeah no, I'm, I'm a very i don't i'm a very happy person i'm a very fortunate person in my career i, I think it's also just the hassle of technology sometimes for me like I it was it. cool enough getting a studio recording and learning how to do all this stuff and learn about audio engineering and then i just go oh website and i gotta learn coding and you know web design and graphic mm. and i just i just i don't know it never it always seemed like too much for me <laughs> yeah i hear you i hear you well Thank you, Dennis J. Arcano. J stands for Joseph. Joseph. All right. My grandfather's name. Yeah. Really. Well, thank you yeah. for being a part of this podcast. I, I it's great to catch up with you and learn a lot more about you that I didn't know. I hear your backstory. And hopefully your words of wisdom will inspire the next generation of Broadway musicians. And uh hopefully I'll see you walking around Times Square one day. Uh, yes, we definitely got to catch up. Yes, I, I'm I'm humbled and honored to have been a guest on your show, man. It's been really great talking with you too and hearing what all these drummers have to say and learning from each other. is That's what it's all about, man. Share the knowledge. So thanks for, for doing this. This is great. Mm -hmm.